for what they do. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, so I'm going to be talking to you today about um, how we can use stochastic fluctuations to make uh, quantum systems do things that we might not normally expect in um, sort of typical thermodynamics. Uh, so this is a joint work with um, uh, Marty Perenau Labette at the, at the um, University of Geneva. Um, so this this talk falls into the uh, sort of field of uh, stochastic and quantum thermodynamics. So I'll just sort of give you a very brief summary of what these fields are. Um, so of course we're we're familiar with macroscopic thermodynamics as being a theory that describes really our everyday experience of many particles interacting and how these uh, govern sort of heat flow and irreversibility. Um, but we can also think about systems that are a lot smaller. So if we think of things like um, biomolecular motors or single enzymes, Brownian motors, um, then we can talk about the thermodynamics of these, uh, which falls under the umbrella of classical stochastic thermodynamics. So they're still classical systems. Um, but we can go even smaller than that and think about sort of individual ions and atoms, electrons that interact with an environment and we can talk about the, the thermodynamic laws in these systems. Um, the main theme of these two, these two examples is that now we have to start caring about fluctuations and how these affect things like heat and work. Um, so this is what I'll be talking about today. Um, so just to summarize here, there's been quite a lot of progress in recent years in quantum thermodynamics of sort of designing uh, heat engines and other machines that consists of just say a single ion or a quantum dot. Uh, and using these machines to, to generate like a work output. Um, so the idea is that eventually maybe these could be useful in, in things like uh, quantum transport, quantum computing, things like this. Um, so I'm gonna be talking about uh, sort of um, how these systems, uh, sort of the nature of uh, work, work extraction in these small systems. Uh, so the very general setup I'm talking about here is say some uh, system which we take to be very small quantum mechanical maybe interacting with an environment and it has some microscopic Hamiltonian that we control in time and we use that to generate some output of work or useful energy. Um, so in standard thermodynamics, we know that the the work should always be bounded by uh, the free energy decrease of this system. So there's a, a limit to how much energy we can get out or conversely if we take this around a cycle, then we shouldn't expect to be able to extract anything from, the, from, a, from a cycle, from a thermal source. Uh, so that's what we would expect normally in thermodynamics. Um, so if we wanna talk about quantum systems, we need to define what we mean by work. Um, so this is done, it's probably the most standard way of doing this, uh, is to first start with a kind of bread and butter assumption, which is that we have some Markovian master equation describing our system. Uh, so it's interacting it with its bath and we're, we're varying its Hamiltonian in time. Um, so what we can do is we can use a thing known as uh, quantum jump unraveling. Uh, so we can monitor how the open system sort of evolves stochastically as it interacts with the environment. So it will go from one energy state to another if we uh, measure the system and then we can record various jumps that it undergoes and um, those jumps represent sort of increments of heat that are exchanged. Uh, so if we monitor this, then we can say that the work extracted is given by, well, really just through energy conservation of this, this sort of process. Um, so the, the, the main point is that if we do this, then we're going to observe a kind of work distribution. So these things are going to be stochastic because we've got uh, uncertainty for measurements and thermal noise. And so this will result in some statistical distribution of, of energy output. Um, one of the key results in both uh, stochastic and quantum thermodynamics is the, the Jarzinski fluctuation theorem. So this tells us uh, that there is a sort of fundamental restriction on the kind of work distributions that we can observe. Um, so really it means that the, the average exponential of the work is always equal to the exponential of the free energy. So this is independent of any process that you take. Um, so this is a fairly strong statement and it automatically implies the, the sort of second law that we're used to, which is that the work is always bounded by the free energy. 
However, this is only a statement about what happens on average. Um, so the key thing I want to discuss today is what happens in these kind of more um, unusual situations where you have fluctuations above this average bound. Um, yeah, so we can think about what are, so that, so that we're not um, in these kind of small regimes, it, we can have trajectories which extract work beyond what we should really be allowed. Um, but there is a limit on how likely this can occur. So the fluctuation theorem gives you a sort of fundamental bound, which says that the likelihood of extracting work above some threshold lambda is essentially exponentially unlikely as you go to larger violations. So this kind of makes sense because it means that as you go to the macroscopic limit, this becomes you know, exponentially small and we don't really observe it. However, if we stick to looking at small systems, then this right-hand side can be you know, fairly significant. It can be greater than 50%. You know, we can actually have situations where the majority of trajectories do seem to violate the second law and get more energy than we should be allowed. Um, so then the, the question is, how do we actually maximize the chance of this occurring? Uh, so this, uh, this was actually proven in a paper by uh, Kavina Mari and G Giovanetti, I think about six years ago. So they found the kind of process you need to do to really maximize the chance of getting these unlikely events. Um, and so what they found was that you need to create a work distribution that consists of two peaks. So you need a very tall peak um, that sits above the, the free energy, which this is the kind of uh, unlikely or unexpected violation you want. And as long as you balance that with a smaller peak that gives you a sort of failure probability, then you can reach this, this upper limit given by the Jarzinski theorem. Um, and more importantly, they showed the kind of process you need to do to actually reach this. Um, so it kind of goes as follows. So you say, let's start with a simple two level system where you're, you're varying the energy gap of the system in time. So we begin at some initial energy. And what we need to do is we need to lower that energy via an isothermal process. So an isothermal process here means that you go quasi statically and you stay in equilibrium at all times. And then when you get to this point, so I call this step A, you then need to do a very rapid change in the energy up to a much higher value. So this is almost instantaneous. Um, and then finally, we lower the energy back along another isotherm. Um, so as long as you do this, then you, you do actually saturate this, uh, this bound and you will see that the majority of trajectories do give you more work than the free energy. Uh, so they, they show how that you, you just have to tune these energy levels in the, in the protocol so that you can reach it. Um, so they did this in an actual experiment a couple of years ago. So they took a single electron transistor. It's interacting with some superconducting reservoir. Um, and they're, cha they're changing the charging energy and monitoring how much energy they get out of this transistor. Uh, and so they can change how fast they change this energy. So they can do it slowly. So this kind of this ramp here represents one of the, the isotherms that they want to do. Then they do a very sudden jump, uh, which is this middle step followed by another slow ramp back down to the original energy. Uh, so then they monitor the work distribution of this kind of process, uh, and they do get one of these work distributions that has two peaks. So uh, I think there's, they're representing work uh, with a minus sign here. So really in my talk, this should be the other way around. But yeah, they find that um, you know, within a good chance of above 65% of the time you do observe a net out, output of work, even though that you have a cycle. Um, but we notice that there's some problems with this, at least we see that these are not really true delta peaks. So this is not an actual, this is a suboptimal process. It's not actually reaching what, uh, what we would really like to do. So there's, there's clearly experimental imperfections going on. Uh, and I just want to talk about how we mo how we can actually model these more realistic uh, experimental effects in this process and how we can try and improve it. Um, and the, the key point is that because these systems have a finite relaxation time, we can't really do perfect isotherms. So what we really would observe in, in a more realistic situation is that the system will be in its equilibrium state plus some sort of linear, small linear correction. So this linear correction will scale inversely with how fast we're going. 
Um, and so this, this extra term here is responsible for giving us sort of imperfections in the isotherms. Um, so the question I want to address is uh, what actually happens to the, the bound, the optimal bound that we can try and achieve. It's not going to be as high as the Jarzinski bound, it's going to be somewhere lower. Uh, so what, what I've shown just now is like you can actually derive a, a sort of finite time version of this bound. Uh, and what it does is it gives us a, an optimal control problem because now we have to actually worry about how we actually change the energy uh, to actually reach this, this limit. Um, so the way the protocol works in finite time is we take, say, a Hamiltonian of our system. Uh, it's got a number of energy levels that can be d-dimensional. And we want to be able to control all of the levels in the Hamiltonian. Uh, we can also control the eigenstates, but it's not um, necessary for the process. Um, so the only difference now is that we model the isotherms with these linear corrections. So we're saying that along step A and C, which I label with X here, uh, we're going to be in some equilibrium state plus some correction, which has its own duration um, associated with it. And then what, what happens now is we have to define how we actually change these energy values along these processes. So we're going to start becoming dependent on the actual protocol. Um, and then finally, we can make sure that we keep this quench in the middle. So you remember, you need a, a, a rapid jump in the middle. Um, so as long as we have control of the levels, then we can just shift them by a sudden amount to achieve that. Um, yeah, so the way I proceed now is that I use this quantum jump unraveling technique that I showed you at the start uh, to monitor uh, how the work um, is extracted along different trajectories, uh, given these assumptions about the dynamics. And what you do find theoretically is you get um, a distribution that looks exactly like they see in this experiment. So if, instead of two delta peaks, we actually get two Gaussians, a uh, convex sum of two Gaussians. So this peak here, this tall one, is sitting above the threshold where we would like to essentially get more energy than we should be allowed. And then we have another smaller peak which balances it out and ensures that we're still satisfying the fluctuation theorem. Um, and then what happens is we see a new quantity becomes relevant. So I call this the partial entropy production, which is uh, sigma. And this is measuring the finite width that you now observe in these, these distributions. So the, the, the entropy production is sort of a measure of how um, suboptimal we're actually becoming in these finite time corrections. Uh, and we can directly calculate a new um, bound essentially on how likely we are to violate the, the second law. So it's given by this complementary error function, which now depends on this entropy production. Um, and now the key point is that this is a monotonically decreasing in the entropy production. So this tells us a, a sort of um, pretty important physical principle, which is that if we do want to maximize the likelihood of getting this work, then we need to minimize how much entropy we produce. Um, so there's a, there's a wealth of literature on how to minimize entropy production in open systems. Uh, but the key, the key point is you want to choose a process where it's, uh, the rate at which it's generated is constant. That's, that's the basic uh, idea. So if you can find a process which does that, then you can uh, minimize the entropy production. And you find that it's actually related to some functions which are path independent, and they have a geometric interpretation. So there, these L's here are what I call um, thermodynamic length associated with the isotherms. Um, and finally, you can also optimize the time you need to spend on each of these isotherms as well. Um, so yeah, so to give you a very brief summary of what thermodynamic length is, uh, when you have these open systems, you can actually associate a kind of metric with the process. And the metric depends on the open system dynamics as well as the curvature of the free energy. And when you have this metric, you can define a distance, which we call the thermodynamic length. Uh, so this distance is uh, dependent on 
um, how you're controlling the system. So it's a, it's a function of the different control variables, which in our case are the energy gaps. Um, and so with this, you get a geodesic equation. So if you can solve this, it tells you how you should actually control the system in order to get the minimum entropy. Um, so this is what we do. And we get our finite time version of this Jasinski bound. So this new result here, you see it depends on the, how long you actually take to do the process. And it depends on these geometric quantities. So this is really our, our main result. So I think this is a more, rea more realistic bound than, than the sort of optimal one presented at the start. Um, and we can look at how it scales with time. So we actually see that really this thing scales uh, slower than one over square root of the time. Um, so this is actually telling us that you get a pretty significant finite time correction. Um, so the conclusion from that is that even small finite time effects can have a pretty bad effect on your ability to actually do these optimal things. Um, so I'll just conclude with a, a simple example. So we have a, a quantum dot. So it's just a, a qubit that we're changing its energy levels. Uh, and it has a very simple master equation with a single relaxation time. Uh, and yeah, we can plot what this uh, distribution should be because we can find out exactly what this thermodynamic length is for this system. Uh, maybe it's not so important, but if you look at the graph here, I've got the probability, the maximum probability of getting positive work around a, a closed cycle. Uh, the red line here is this Jarzinski bound, and the solid black line is our new bound, and we're plotting this as a function of the inverse time. So over, over here, we're saying that we're going very slowly and we get perfect isotherms. But really, in a realistic experiment, we're more like in this regime. Uh, and so we see there is a very significant um, difference. We're not really able to get anywhere near the, the optimal bounds that we'd like with fairly reasonable timescales. Um, OK, so I think I can summarize. Um, yeah, so the main lessons of the talk are that um, yeah, so we can use stochastic fluctuations in small systems to, I mean, I say cheat the second law, that's not really what we're doing. We're still satisfying the second law on average, but we can make use of fluctuations in order to find the majority of instances actually get you more energy than you should be allowed. Um, and the way you do this is combining a pair of isothermal processes with a very rapid jump in the middle. Um, but then what I tried to highlight is that even, yeah, small finite time imperfections can cause a pretty bad effect on how optimal this process can be. Uh, and so then I showed that the best way to, try to protect against this is to choose protocols that give you a constant rate of entropy production. Um, and you can do this using these techniques from uh, geometry uh, to identify a kind of uh, a path in the parameter space you need to follow. Uh, and so the, the last point is that I haven't really mentioned what this is useful for. <laughs> so this is very a uh, proof of principle idea, but what we're thinking of in the future is that hopefully, um, so, okay, clearly you can't use this to just give you loads of energy because, you know, you average it over many runs and you're still going to satisfy the second law. However, I think situation where it could be useful is one where you have, say, a chemical reaction or a sort of biological process that has some kind of uh, threshold or activation energy that you want to, you just need to jump over that energy for it to occur. Um, so if you, if you have a process like this, then maybe you could use these fluctuations, uh, exploit them in this way to increase the rate at which that kind of process might occur. Because you only need it, uh, it's, it's not a case of increasing the energy yield, it's a, a case of improving the rate at which it occurs. So, I mean, yeah, hopefully we figure this out um, in our next paper about how to use this. But yeah, hopefully I've, I've identified how you would do it optimally if it is useful. So thank you for listening. <laughs>